Hello, my name is Kevin Frost, and I'm an HVAC engineer at Slipstream. In this short video, I'm going to present on the basics of HVAC control systems and focus on the components of that control system. This presentation will be broken into three parts, where we cover the three parts of a control system, the sensor, the controller, and the control device. At the end, we'll go over a quick example to show how these components work together to form the control system for an HVAC system. In the previous webinar, you should have learned about the building automation system, or the BAS, and the BAS architecture. The components we'll be talking about today will be focusing on the field controllers, what's actually controlling the HVAC equipment that maintains the climate of your building. Like I stated before, the basic components of a control system are the sensor, the controller, and the control device. And the sensor is sometimes called the input device, and the control device is sometimes called the output device. This is because the sensor sends an input signal into the controller, and the controller sends an output signal to the control device. The terminology around the signals, input and output, can be confusing. Uh, just remember that the signal is labeled in its relation to the controller. Inputs go into the controller and outputs go out of the controller. So let's start with sensors or the input device. The sensor is simply a device that measures a controlled variable. What's the controlled variable? Well, for the thermostat that's shown in the top right of the screen, that's space temperature. It's simply whatever we're trying to measure and usually control in the building. It could be air temperature, it could be water or fluid temperature, duct or pipe static pressure, airflow through a duct, or electric current that's going to a piece of equipment. Sensors then transmit that signal to the controller. And there's two main types of signals, binary and analog. Binary is sometimes also called digital. But in the Department of Defense UFGS specifications, it's referred to by the term binary, and that's the term we will be using in our presentations. A binary input signal is simply an on-off signal. It's a one or a zero. Sometimes you can count ones, uh, and that's technically also binary. But it differs from analog, an analog signal which, is a which covers a range. The thermostat shown in the top right is an analog signal. It's sending a signal that represents 73.3 degrees. That thermostat may have a range from 60 to 100, for example. Um, but you can see that it differs from binary, where, it's, where there's really only two signals binary can send, well, one or a zero, on or off. Some examples of binary input devices are switches, the simplest one being a push button switch. If you push the push button, you can turn on a piece of equipment, and if you push it again, you'll turn it off. You can also use these for other control variables, such as level switches. If you have a water tank and you want it to stop at a certain height, you can place a water switch at that level. When the water reaches that, that height, the switch will flip and tell a pump to turn off. You can do that with many other controlled variables, such as air sensing switches, or current switches. Current switches are commonly used to check if a device is working properly. If it's being commanded, if the piece of equipment is being commanded on and the current switch doesn't detect that electric current is going to the device, you can tell something is wrong in the system. Occupancy sensors are another example of a binary input device. They detect occupancy and will tell you if a room is occupied or if it's not occupied. There are many types of analog sensors. We've already discussed thermostats and temperature sensors, but you can also have pressure, pressure sensors, current transducers, flow sensors. There's many types. A good example of the difference between a analog sensor and a binary sensor would be the current transducer. A current switch detects whether or not there's electricity flowing through a wire. But a current transducer is trying to tell how much current, how many amps are flowing through that wire. So those input signals from the sensor are sent to the controller. What is a controller? 
The controller is just a device that receives the input from the sensor, compares it to a set point, and sends an output to adjust the control device. Let's go through an example to, to see how this works. Here we have a room that's being heated by a hot water heat exchanger. The temperature sensor, the input device, detects the spaces at 68 degrees and sends that signal to the controller. The controller then compares it to its set point. Its current set point is 70 degrees. We're trying to maintain the space at 70 degrees. The controller detects that there's a difference between the input signal and the set point. And because it detects a difference, it sends an output signal to the hot water valve, the control device, to open. The control device will then open and then we can start heating the space. Here's an example of a field controller. This one is by Destech Controls. You'll see that it's essentially a miniature computer. On the right is a board for inputs and output signals. This is where we physically wire in sensors and control devices to communicate with the controller. There's usually a section for analog. Sometimes they're universal inputs and outputs. Uh, universal just means it can accept analog or digital. Analog signals usually are transmitted in a direct digital control system where you would use this device. Uh, in zero to 10 volts DC, or four to 20 milliamps. There's another section of the board for binary in outputs. Again, these are your on off signals. This controller happens to have a wireless port to communicate wirelessly with devices. Um, this is an emergency technology in building automation systems, um, but hopefully it will become more common. Here's a picture of some more controllers. In the top right of your screen, you'll see an air terminal box, um, commonly seen in variable air volume systems. What's important to note here is that it comes with a prepackaged controller. When you're specifying equipment, make sure that you know whether or not it comes with its own controller. If it doesn't come with its own controller, you, need, you might need to specify a separate controller from the controls contractor to go with it. In the bottom right, you'll see a thermostat, which is also a sensor, but does include a controller. In your home air conditioning system, the thermostat is the controller that is sending an output signal to your furnace or air conditioning unit to turn on and off. And the last part of the control system is the control device. The control device is simply the device that affects the process in a way that changes our controlled variable. And these receive binary outputs or analog outputs. Some examples of control devices affecting the control variable would be your home air conditioning unit, which has a compressor. We can turn that on to cool down space temperature. Perhaps we have a fan with a variable frequency drive or VFD and we want to speed up that fan to increase duct static pressure to increase the flow rate through our system. Or, as in our previous example, we have a valve that needs to open to allow hot water to a, co air, to a hot water coil to increase air temperature. We'll now go through a few examples of control devices, starting with binary output devices. The most common binary output device is the relay. Three, two, one. Now we'll go through a few examples of control devices that are common in the HVAC system. We'll start with binary output devices and the most common binary output device is the relay. A relay is an electric switch that opens and closes to control another electric circuit. The most common version of these are motor starters, um, but also other equipment contactors. If you look at the bottom right figure, you'll see we have a relay coil uh, at the, in the top. When this switch closes with a command from the field controller, it will energize this relay coil. When this relay coil is energized, it will clo the, close the relay contact. 
completing the circuit that provides energy to the motor and starting the motor. Another example of a binary output device are two position valves and dampers. These can have be solenoid valves or they could have rotary actu actuators, but they're basi basically used for open and closed valves and dampers. There's three main types of analog control devices that you commonly see in HVAC systems. There's the modulating control valve and actuator, the modulating control damper and actuator, and variable frequency drives. We'll go through each of these, but you'll notice that with valves and dampers, they each have actuator assemblies. So what is the actuator? The actuator is simply a small motor that will rotate the valve and damper stems. They can be two position as discussed before, so they're binary. They can be floating, which is a version of binary, or they can be modulating, which is very common uh, as well. The way modulating works is a signal comes from the controller. That signal essentially will be telling the motor, hey, open to 40% open. Uh, and the motor will rotate exactly to 40%. One important thing you need to specify when you order actuators is its fail position. When valves lose power, they typically fail in last position. This is because it's just a motor and it won't move unless it's commanded to do to move one way or another. To get it to fail open or closed, you need to add a physical spring to the motor, which will force the motor open or closed. A good example of how this can be problematic is with a steam valve on a humidifier. If a steam valve is open during operation, but power is lost, that steam valve will might remain in last position if you didn't specify it to normally close. A steam valve in last position means it'll just start dumping steam into a space. That can create mold problems or potential safety hazards. So you want to make sure that you get a spring return for that particular valve. There's three types of control dampers that you typically see. Single blade dampers, parallel blade dampers, and opposed blade dampers. Single blade dampers usually have one blade. Um, they're put in small round ducts usually. Parallel blades, which is the cross section on the left, have all the blades of the, of the damper in parallel. Um, these are typically used in on-off on applications. Um, sometimes they're used in modulating where there's a high degree of pressure drop. More common though in modulating applications, you use the opposed blade. By having the blades alternate their angles, you have much more control over the air pressure change in the system. It's important to work with your controls contractor and or your HVAC engineer when uh, sizing and selecting the control, the type of control dampers you will use. Then there's control valves. There's many types of control valves, but most typical we use characterized ball valves for valves that are two inches and less. Uh, for four inches and less, you start to see globe valves. And for anything larger than that, you start to see larger butterfly valves. Another alternative for small pipes valves are pressure independent control valves. These valves are self-balancing and remove the cost for adding a separate balancing valve. Uh, the valves pictured here are two-way valves, but you can also get three-way valves. Three-way valves can be mixing or diverting. Mixing valves is where you are mixing two different fluid streams. Whereas with diverting valves, you are picking between two different fluid flow paths. And the final control device we'll cover is the variable frequency drive or VFD. VFDs have electric inverters that modulate the frequency of electric current to adjust the speed of motors. Power comes in from the power plant at 60 hertz AC. The VFD inverter will convert that to DC, change the frequency, convert it back to AC, and then feed it to the motor of your fan or pump. Um, when it does this, uh, it can change the frequency from anywhere from 6 hertz 
to higher than 60 hertz where you can overspeed the motors. This change in frequency is proportional to the change in the RPM of the motor. It's important to use VFDs whenever you have a variable air volume or a variable water system. And the reason we want to do that is because as we lower speeds to match the building load, we can save a ton of energy. Over 80% sometimes if you go if you go low enough. I would also recommend installing VFDs on constant volume fans and pumps. And that is for easy rebalancing. Uh, it's a lot easier to push a VFD button a couple times to slow a fan down or to speed up a fan than it is to reshiv the, uh, the belts on a motor or install a new impeller on a pump. So to conclude this presentation, I'd like to go through a few control examples. We'll start with uh, the hot water heat exchanger from earlier in the presentation. Again, we have the three components of our control system, the sensor, the controller, and the control device. Our sensor, the thermostat, detects that the room is at 68 degrees, and it sends an input signal to the controller. The controller then compares that input signal to the set point. Its set point right now is 70 degrees, and the difference between the input signal and the set point means that the controller determines it needs to send an output signal to the control device. And that output signal is to open the hot water valve. It sends that signal to the valve actuator. It, the actuator rotates to match the signal, which opens the valve and allows hot water to the heat exchanger, which starts warming the space. And the space reaches 70 degrees. The HVAC system is just a series of these control loops working together for the complete operation of the system. As an example of that, let's see what else happens in the system when that hot water valve opens. As the hot water valve opens, the pressure in the hot water line will drop. We have a pressure transducer which detects this drop in pressure. It sends a signal to its controller, which compares the pressure to its set point and determines the pressure is too low. It then sends an output signal to a pump VFD to increase in frequency and speed up the pump. This increases the flow rate in the system. Meanwhile, later in the system, there's a temperature probe that detects that the hot water temperature is dropping in the line because we're using energy to heat the space. That temperature probe sends an input signal into its controller, which compares it to its set point and realizes the temperature is too low. It then sends an output signal to kick on the boiler. And with that, you almost have a complete operating HVAC system if the only goal is to warm the space. All, in a, all an HVAC control system is is a series of these loops that keep working together for the complete operation of the system. And with that, we conclude the presentation. Thank you for listening. The next presentation will be on the basics of control systems and control response.